right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for joining this uh, Device Tree 101 webinar. I'm really happy to see that there has been so much interest in this webinar that we are organizing at Bootlin in partnership with ST. Um, so I'm going to introduce myself briefly. I am Thomas Pedazzoni. I am the Chief Technical Officer at Bootlin, which I joined in 2008. I am one of the uh, Embedded Linux and Kernel engineers in uh, the Bootlin team. And as such, I have been one of the author of the Device Tree for Dummies talk, which I gave in 2013-2014. And this webinar is an attempt to be an update of that talk with more details and more content. I am also one of the co-maintainers of BuildRoot, an open source embedded Linux build system. And I have been contributing to the Linux kernel with over 900 patches uh, that have been um, merged into the Linux kernel. And this is this experience which I am sharing today in this device tree talk. I also happen to be one of the members of the uh, program committee for the Embedded Linux conference, both US and Europe. And I'm based in Toulouse, which is located in the southwest of France. So today, the agenda for this uh, webinar is first to introduce Bootlin, uh, then to introduce the STM32MP1 platform. And finally, we'll get uh, to the, the bulk of the, the, the topic, uh, the device tree. So why do we need the device tree? What is the basic syntax of the device tree? What is the concept of device tree inheritance? What we mean by device tree specifications and bindings? And what is the interaction between device tree and Linux kernel drivers? And we will also discuss common device tree properties and a number of examples. And finally, we will have a Q&A session. You can ask ses uh, questions in the chat throughout the talk. And one of my colleagues, Alexandre Belloni, will be there to moderate the, the chat and the Q&A session. Uh, so first, let's introduce Bootling. Uh, we've been in business since 2004. We have an engineering team based in France, but we serve customers worldwide. In, in fact, less than 20% of our revenue comes from France. Uh, all our other customers are in other countries, in European Union or outside. And our uh, expertise is highly focused. We do only embedded Linux work. So um, embedded Linux kernel development, bootloader development and embedded Linux system integration. Our activities are trainings, which are about 20% of our revenue, and the rest are engineering uh, projects for our customer, about 80% of our revenue. And we are an authorized partner of ST since 2019. Uh, so our training offer is made of six different training courses uh, covering a wide range of topics around embedded Linux. So we have a, a first course on embedded Linux system development, which is an introduction to embedded Linux. We have a course around Linux kernel driver development, which dives into uh, the Linux kernel APIs to develop kernel drivers. We have a course on Yocto to learn how to build embedded Linux system using Yocto. Another course around BuildRoot with pretty much the same idea, but focused on the BuildRoot tool instead of Yocto. We have a course around the Linux graphic stack, which is a pretty complex uh, stack, uh, software stack in Linux. And so we have a complete course dedicated to that. And finally, a recent course that we announced is around boot time optimization, a very important topic for many embedded Linux projects. Uh, so why would you choose uh, those courses? Why they are kind of unique? First, um, our training materials are entirely freely available, and this is quite unique. There are very few training businesses in the world that do that. Um, they usually kept their training material secret. We have chosen a completely different approach, which consists in completely opening our training materials. So they are uh, available under an open source license, the Creative Commons by SA license. And this allows everyone to verify in detail the contents of the course, and it shows our commitment to knowledge sharing. Another thing that makes us unique is that we have experienced trainers, which are not just trainers. They are most of the time engineers who work on real engineering projects all year round. And from time to time, they teach uh, uh, training courses. And this allows them to have very up-to-date uh, experience and in-field experience as well. And our training courses are worldwide recognized. We have taught hundreds of sessions all around the world to thousands of engineers for the past 15 years. Beyond this training activity, we also have an engineering services activity, uh, which again is, is the, the most important part of our work. And there, what we do is mainly the development of BSP, board support packages for our customers. So we port bootloaders and the Linux kernel, we write Linux kernel drivers, we do system integration with Yocto, BuildRoot, and deliver fully functional, uh, ready to use Linux board support packages to our customers for their custom hardware platform.
we are able to upstream the changes that we make to provide long-term maintenance. Uh, so we can upstream changes to U-Boot, to the Linux kernel, to Yocto, to BuildRoot and other open source projects as well. Uh, we also offer consulting and technical support around embedded Linux topics. Our customers are mainly silicon vendors who contract us to uh, implement U-Boot, Linux, BuildRoot or Yocto support for their products and usually they ask us to also uh, provide this work in the upstream official projects. And the second category of customers are embedded system manufacturers who deliver uh, real embedded products in various industries, transportation, healthcare, uh, entertainment, home automation, and, and many others. And for those customers, we provide um, complete BSP or specific drivers, debugging, optimization, and consulting around embedded Linux topics. Bootlin is also a major open source contributor. We are the 20th contributing company worldwide to the Linux kernel. As can be seen on the right of the slide, there, this is the complete list of companies who have contributed to Linux since the, the Linux project started using Git. And we have contributed over 7,600 patches, mainly around hardware support. This commitment is not just around contributing, but also uh, participating more actively. And several of our engineers are maintainers of various subsystems in the Linux kernel, such as iCubeC, RTC, MTD, and several platform support. We are also a key contributor to BuildRoot. Um, I am personally one of the co-maintainers, and collectively at Bootlin, we have contributed over 5,000 patches to this project. We also contribute to the Yocto project, and we've made contributions to Bearbox, to U-Boot, to the Linux test project, and several open source projects as well. In addition to that, as I mentioned earlier, our training materials are all freely available, and we give numerous talks at conferences to share technical knowledge. And this webinar is another example of, of these contributions that we make to the open source community. So with that bootlin introduction out of the way, I no need to talk a little bit about the STM32MP1 platform. Indeed, this webinar is organized in partnership with ST, and all the examples that we will use will be based on that platform. Um, so ST has a very strong portfolio in MCU, microcontrollers, that is very uh, worldwide known. And in 2019, they launched a new series of MPU, so microprocessors, um, which is called the STM32MP1 family of processors. And on this slide, you have um, the block diagram of the STM32MP157F, which is one of the SOCs available in this STM32MP1 family. Uh, so this is kind of the, the high-end one, uh, the 157F. Uh, it is uh, based around a dual-core Cortex-A7 at 800 MHz, uh, together with a Cortex-M4, which gives you the ability to run real-time applications next to a Linux uh, system running on the A7. And it has a GPU. Uh, in addition to that, plenty of connectivity peripherals for uh, display, so RGB interface, but also DSi, a camera interface, HDMI, uh, gigabit Ethernet, CAN, USB, um, um, I2C, SPI, SDIO, of course, um, and plenty of other interfaces, DACs, ADCs, uh, PWM for motor control, lots of security features. So it is really a very featureful um, SOC. So this uh, STM32MP1 family um, has multiple variants of that um, SOC, and it is important to describe that as it has an impact on the device discussion that we will have later in this uh, webinar. Um, so uh, they have different variants, as I mentioned, the first one being the 151. The 151 with the, you know, the lowest end of the, the family, it has a single core A7 um, and it is available at uh, 650 MHz or 800 MHz. Um, and in this variant, there is no GPU, there's no CAN, and there's no DSi um, interface for display. Um, and each of those variants is available with or without security. So for example, the 151A is without crypto and, and secure boot functionality, while the 151C is available with security. The 153 is uh, an improvement over the 151. It has the dual core A7 and it brings uh, two CAN interfaces. And then finally, the 157 uh, brings even more functionality. Uh, in the sense that it brings the GPU and the DSi interface. And each time, as you can see, uh, there are two variants uh, with without security and uh, at 650 or 800 megahertz. 
Um, together with those SOC, ST has um, put together two very nice uh, evaluation platforms which are available at a very affordable cost. There is the DK1 Discovery Kit 1 and the DK2 Discovery Kit 2. So let's start with the DK1 Discovery Kit 1. Um, it is based on the Wine 57A SOC, so it is the, the highest end one, but the variant without security features. It has half a gigabyte of memory, micro SD, a gigabit Ethernet connection, it has USB C, uh, four USB A connectors, LEDs, buttons, it has HDMI, a Nojo Connect uh, codec, a DSI connector so that you can connect a, pan a display panel. It has GPIO connectors, uh, which are compatible with Arduino and Raspberry Pi shields. It also has an onboard ST link, so you can reflash and have access to a JTAG interface without extra hardware. Uh, the Discovery Kit 2 is kind of an improvement on top of the Discovery Kit 1. It uses the 157C SOC, which brings um, security features. And in addition to that, it has a Wi-Fi and Bluetooth uh, chip. And as you can see on the picture, it has a display and touchscreen. So there are, and, and of course, all the, the other features that the Discovery Kit 1 had. Um, so if we look at that Discovery Kit 2 platform and, and as a partial block diagram, this block diagram is definitely not showing all the, the blocks that you can find, uh, but it is uh, illustrating uh, briefly uh, what it looks like. So at the core, we have a system on chip, which is this gray box. It is composed of a number of IP blocks, which are all those yellow boxes um, that are uh, provide features such as GPIO, MMC, I2C, GPU, UART, DSI, crypto, and many of those functionalities, as well as the CPU cores, uh, blue in the middle. And then around the system on chip, on the board, we have a variety of peripherals such as a DDR memory, a display panel, a PMIC uh, connected to I2C, we have a micro SD connector, a Wi Fi chip, an Ethernet Fi, a touchscreen controller, an HDMI transceiver, an audio codec, and all of these peripherals on the board are connected to various IP blocks inside the system on chip. Um, so this brings us to progressively to the topic of device tree. Indeed, um, on hardware platforms, there are typically uh, two different types of buses. There are some buses that provide what we call disk variability mechanisms, mechanisms that allow um, the system that runs on the CPU to ask the hardware uh, what devices are connected to the platform and what are their characteristics. This is, for example, the case for USB or PCIe. On USB, when you plug a webcam on your system, the system doesn't have to know in advance that you will plug this model of webcam on that particular USB port. Indeed, the USB standard and the USB bus includes enumeration mechanism, discoverability mechanisms that allows your system to query uh, the USB bus and ask the devices that are connected who they are, uh, what are their characteristics, their model, and, and, and things like that. And there is this concept of vendor ID, product ID, device class that exists in both USB and, and PCI that allows an operating system to uniquely know which device is connected on the system for USB and PCI buses. And thanks to that, an operating system can easily identify what is the driver that should be responsible for that device and how that driver can actually talk to that particular device. So that's very good. But unfortunately, not all buses provide such discoverability mechanisms. And in practice, in embedded platforms, many of the buses to which we connect peripherals do not support such discoverability mechanisms. I2C, SPI, OneWire, memory map devices, all of these devices, they typically don't support discoverability. So the operating system that runs on the CPU needs to know what is connected on those buses and how they are connected to the rest of the system. And again, those embedded systems that we work with, they typically make extensive use of such buses. So the question is, how does the operating system get to know what is the topology of the hardware? Um, so the description that we uh, need to provide to the operating system um, allows the operating system to know things like Okay, my system on chip is a dual A7 uh, CPU. It has maybe two UART controller, which are, uh, have their register mapped at that particular physical address uh, and that are using these particular RQ lines. It has maybe three I2C controller of that specific variant with registers at that address and that interrupt line and maybe taking a clock as input from this particular other uh, IP block in the chip. 
It also allows the, the system to know that my board has a particular audio codec which is connected to a given I2C bus and to a given audio interface of the system on chip and that it has a reset signal connected to a particular GPIO of the system on chip. All of those details, they cannot be guessed by the operating system. Indeed, we don't use um, for I2C, memory mapped, SPI and so on, we don't use uh, buses that provide discoverability mechanisms. So we need to know all of those details uh, well ahead of time in kind of a static fashion. So really there are three kind of main different ways that are um, that are used or have been used throughout the Linux history to provide that sort of detail and information to the operating system. These details can be encoded directly into the operating system or bootloader code uh, using a compiled data structure in C. So that was typically what was done on, on ARM and many other platforms in Linux. You would write C data structure, each describing one device of the system in the system. So you would write a C data structure for your first QR controller that gives the address and the interrupt lines and the clocks and so on. Another C data structure for the second UI controller, for the third, the fourth, and similarly for every IP block in your system and in the SOC, but also all the peripherals around the system on chip on your uh, on the complete board. Um, so this um, was done and, and for mainly ARM32 platforms, but also other CPU architecture. But for ARM32 specifically, uh, around 2010 or maybe a bit earlier, uh, this with the, 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 uh, the increase of uh, ARM system on chips and platforms, it really became difficult to maintain. And so a different solution was, um, uh, was identified to, to, to solve the, the maintenance of this significant amount of C data structure to describe a, a wide amount of uh, hardware platforms. The second solution that is used is ACPI tables. This is a solution that is uh, commonly used on x86 Intel systems where uh, the BIOS or, or UEFI firmware provides to the operating system a set of tables, ACPI tables, that give details about the, um, uh, the hardware topology. However, on most Intel systems, a vast majority of the hardware is connected on PCI or USB buses, which do provide discovery mechanism. And so the need to express uh, in a static fashion, the hardware is kind of less um, significant for those, those platforms. And so what ACPI tables used to allow expressing was not that flexible. Um, so it, it, is, it has no grown in, in, in functionality, but back, back 10 years ago, it was less um, powerful than, than it is today. That being said, this is still the, the common mechanism for uh, the BIOS and UEFI firmware on x86 systems to uh, provide hardware description to the kernel. But it is also used on a number of, for example, ARM64 systems, especially the ones that are designed for the server space. And the, the last mechanism, which is going to be uh, the, the, top, the focus of this uh, webinar, obviously, is the device tree. It is a technology that originates from open firmware, uh, something that was started years and years ago by Sun, uh, used initially on the Spark architecture. Then it, uh, it also was used on PowerPC, so there was uh, many years before it got used on ARM in Linux. And um, this open firmware name is the reason why a number of Linux U-boot function that you can find have an OF prefix, and we will see that in, in some parts of that, that webinar. This OF uh, doesn't stand for the, the, word, the English word OFF, but for open firmware. Even though the actual firmware that you use, maybe U-boot or Bearbox or some other bootloader, um, there is still this terminology of open firmware OF that, that sticks around in various places of, of Linux and, and U-Boot and other um, software that uses device tree. And nowadays, the device tree is used for most embedded oriented CPU architectures in the kernel. So ARM32, obviously, but also ARM64, ARC, RISC-V, PowerPC, many, many platforms, Extensa, MIPS. And I think uh, these days, if you want to add support for a new CPU architecture in Linux, it is actually mandatory that it uses the device tree. And therefore, writing or tweaking, modifying a device tree is no, always necessary when you want to port Linux to a new board or when you want to connect additional peripherals to an existing board. And that's what we're going to be discussing in this talk, in this webinar. So the device tree, what it is. At the start, it is a source file uh, called device tree source or DTS in short, and the file extension is .dts. And this source file contains 
a tree data structure which describes the hardware. And this is written by a developer who ports Linux or U-Boot or some other um, operating system or firmware to a particular piece of hardware. So it has to be written by someone with knowledge of the uh, device tree syntax, which hopefully will be you at the end of this webinar. This source file is processed by the device tree compiler, DTC. It's an open source project that, that's available. Um, which will compile that source form into a slightly more efficient representation called the device tree blob, DTB. Actually, most projects, uh, in addition to passing the device trees through the device tree compiler, they also pass the device trees through, through a pass of C preprocessing, which allows to use like sharp defined definition to have nice human readable macros and, and things like that. But the, the bulk of the work is actually done by the device tree compiler, DTC. And so the resulting DTB, device tree blob, uh, is a, uh, contains the information that accurately describes the hardware platform in an operating system agnostic way. And we'll, we'll talk more about that a bit later. To give you an order of magnitude, a typical DTB is around a few dozens of kilobytes. So it's not, it's not huge, right? It, it's not a big data structure, but it is sufficient for an operating system to understand the topology of the hardware. This DTB, is also sometimes called FDT for flattened device tree. So a device tree that has been flattened, it's no longer a tree, it, it's flat. Um, and it's the name that we give to a DTB once it is loaded into memory. And that's why you will also see a number of commands in U-Boot called FDT or a number of APIs in U-Boot or in Linux also called FDT underscore something something. So let's have a look at a quick example. Um, here I have just written a, a simple foo.dts file, which of course doesn't represent at all a hardware platform, right? It's the device tree compiler has no understanding whatsoever of what is inside a device tree file. It is just a bunch of properties and nodes um, that, that are within each other. So this foo.dts starts with a mandatory specification of the version of the device tree language you're using. And I think we're still at v1 today, so that's pretty much a mandatory specification. And then we have the root of the tree, which start at slash, very much like the root file system in Linux starts at slash. Here, the root node starts at slash. And then we have sub nodes and properties. Uh, so I'm welcoming you with bad coffee. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, good coffee doesn't work in hexadecimal. I would have preferred to offer you a good coffee than bad coffee, but bad coffee fits in, in hexadecimal. So we can, we can add more properties and more nodes, and we'll get back to, to that uh, later on, obviously. Then we can compile this uh, device tree source with DTC. We can say DTC, uh, I have an input file dash I, which is a device tree source. And I would like to output a DTB, so a device tree blob, and I compile it. And you can see the device tree blob is just like 169 uh, bytes here, uh, because that's a very small example. Once I have this DTB, I can also decompile it um, with DTC. I can say, tell DTC, okay, my input is a DTB and I would like as output a DTS. And it gives me pretty much exactly the same as the DTS with a few changes here and there, but mostly you can recognize it's the same information. Um, so as you can see here, DTC is not tied to um, building device tree that represent hardware. You can um, feed into DTC any arbitrary tree of nodes and properties and it will happily build them. So how is this blob being used, the DTB? Um, for bootloaders um, like U-Boot or Bearbox or other firmware like uh, TFA, a harm trusted firmware, the blob uh, DTB will typically be linked directly into the code. Indeed, at the time of, um, of the bootloader getting started, we don't yet have access to file systems and very flexible ways of loading data. So it is typically uh, directly bundled into the bootloader binary. Uh, for operating systems, however, it is typically passed to the operating system by the bootloader. Um, that's the most common mechanism that is used for the Linux kernel. So for example, in U-Boot, if you want to start a, a Linux kernel from U-Boot on an ARM32 platform, the command that is used is boot Z, which uh, takes three arguments. The first is the um, RAM address at which your kernel image was loaded. And you can see on the diagram on the right that your kernel image has been loaded somewhere into RAM. Then the second argument is the address of the init RAMFS, which we don't use here, so we specify just a dash. And then the third argument is the address of the DTB. And you can see again on the diagram on, on the right that the DTB must have been loaded uh, in RAM 
uh, prior to that running that command. So really when you start a Linux kernel, you need to have in memory bus the code and data of the kernel, but also this tiny bit of information, the DTB. And on ARM32, the uh, bootloader is going to jump to the entry point of the kernel code uh, with register R2 containing the address of the DTB. So this is part of the boot protocol that is enforced by the Linux kernel on ARM32. Um, and this will allow the Linux kernel to well get its hand on the DTB and parse it and use it. Uh, of course, on, on other CPU architectures, the boot protocol might be different, but there's always this, this idea of a boot protocol that allows the operating system to retrieve um, the device tree blob from the firmware. Uh, before uh, handing the DTB over to the operating system, the bootloader can modify the DTB. Um, unlike compiled code that we can hardly modify, uh, the DTB can be patched by the, uh, by the bootloader or by the firmware, and you put um, actually does that or bare box or most uh, open source bootloaders. The parsing of the DTB uh, by Linux or by U-Boot can be done by a library called libfdt, which is provided as part of the DTC project or simply with ad hoc code because, well, the, 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 the um, internals of a device tree blob are not very complicated to parse. So that's pretty much how the device tree blob gets seen by the operating system. Now, how do you get those device tree files? Of course, you can write them from scratch, but it is quite some work to describe uh, new hardware platforms. So where do we store and keep track of device tree sources? Um, so they are operating system agnostic, so ideally, they should be hosted in some kind of uh, central and, and operating system neutral project or location. And this has been often discussed, but never really happened. So these days, kind of the, the most official canonical location for device resource files is the Linux kernel source code. Um, for most CPU architecture in Arch, name of the CPU architecture boot DTS, this is where you will find the device resource files. And there are actually um, around uh, 4,700 device resource files as of Linux 5.10. And most of the other projects that use device trees, they end up duplicating those device trees, sometimes syncing them on a regular basis within their source code. So in U-Boot, in Verbox, in TFA, so the ARM trusted firmware, you will also find device trees, which are very often duplicated, sometimes tweaked a little bit compared to the ones in the Linux kernel, but they are fairly similar. So if we take the example of the um, MP157A Discovery Kit 1 platform and see which device tree files get used for the different parts of its uh, boot process. And the boot process of the uh, MP1 uh, has multiple stages, like is the case on, on most system on chip. The first stage is TFA, so, so the, which was um, um, named ARM Trusted Firmware in the past, uh, which is really the first stage bootloader for that platform. It uses the device tree, and the device tree that describes the um, uh, discovery kit one is in mdt slash stm32mp157a-dk1.dts. And to build uh, the ARM trusted firmware for that platform, you need to specify plat equal stm32mp1. And as you can see, this is only like the platform as a whole, the, en the entire system on chip family. And what allows the trusted firmware to really know the details of the particular board and SOC you're using is the fact that you specify an extra environment variable, DTB file name, which says I would like to build TFA specifically for that board which is described by that device tree blob. At the end of the um, build of TFA, you have a single binary, uh, TFA stm32mp157a-dk1.stm32, which includes the code data of TFA, but also bundles the DTB describing the discovery kit platform. For U-Boot, we have pretty much a similar story. Uh, we have a device tree, which is stored in Arch ARM DTS, describing the board and, and the peripherals it has and the system on chip, etc. We configure U-Boot with a configuration that is not board specific. As you can see, it's just named STM32MP15. So you can use this configuration for every board using any of the MP1 system on chips. And what tells U-Boot which particular board we are going to run U-Boot on is the device tree environment variable that you specify at boot time. Thanks to that, U-Boot will build its code and data into a uboot.stm32 binary, 
which will also bundle the device tree blob describing the platform. Finally, for the Linux kernel, the story is a little bit different uh, because we usually have the kernel image and the device tree blob separated. So for this particular platform, the device tree is in Arch, ARM, Boot, DTS, STM32MP1578-DK1.DTS. So you can see the location in different projects is not always exactly the same, uh, but the principle is, is similar. We can configure then the kernel with the multi v7 dev config, which is a configuration that is uh, supporting all ARM v7 platforms. So not just the one from ST, but the one from many other silicon vendors as well in one single kernel image. And so what allows the kernel to know what platform is it runs on is the device tree blob. So at the end of this uh, build process of the kernel, you have a Z image, which contains the kernel code and data supporting a wide range of uh, ARM v7 platforms. And you have a tiny device tree blob that uh, gives um, uh, the description of the hardware to the Linux kernel, which is uh, available as a separate file. So how does it, what it looks like when we boot? Um, so we have uBoot that is built for this um, STM uh, platform. Um, uBoot has two environment variables that we commonly use in, in, this, uh, in this platform to load the kernel and the device tree. So we have kernel ADDRR and FDT ADDRR, which we respectively use to load the kernel image and the device tree blob. And you can see uh, a first example of FDT uh, being used to indicate flattened device tree, which is the location where we will uh, load the device tree blob. So we load uh, our kernel image slash boot slash z image is being loaded at kernel ADDRR in memory. We load the device tree blob at FDT ADDRR also in memory, of course, non-overlapping areas. And then we uh, boot that using this boot z command that I mentioned earlier, passing the address of the kernel in RAM, dash for saying we don't have an init RAMFS, and then the device tree blob. And that boots the kernel. And you can see again, uh, U-Boot telling us the flattened device tree blob is at C4000, uh, booting using the FDT blob. So we see this FDT terminology uh, over and over again. And then it starts the kernel and we can see the kernel prompting us saying, hey, I'm Linux uh, 5.8.13 and I'm running on our ARM v7 processor. And we can see also very early in the boot, this OF, open firmware, FDT, flattened device tree, line which indicates the machine model which is a string um, that is in the device tree itself that identifies kind of the board on which we run. Once we have booted Linux we can also explore the device tree directly on the target. Um, in the sysfs file system which is typically mounted in slash sys there is this sys firmware device tree base folder that you can cd into and in there uh, you can see a representation of the device tree where each node of the device tree is a directory and each property of the device tree is a file that you can cat to watch um, their values. And if you have the device tree compiler available on the target, you can also unpack the device tree using this sysfs representation by using dtc-ifs, which is my input is the sysfs representation of the device tree located there, and it will output you the exact same content as, uh, um, as the DTS with a few different things that are different, but overall it's going to be uh, looking very much like your initial DTS. And that's very nice because it allows you to check that the DTB you're using on your platform is really the one you think you have passed to the kernel. So it, as, a, as a way of double checking what you're using, this CSFS uh, interface is very, very nice. So know that we have um, introduced, I would say, in, uh, globally this device tree concept, let's kind of dive more precisely into the syntax of it. And it's important to understand the terminology that is used uh, to be able to understand the rest of this webinar and generally the documentations that is available around device tree. So device tree, as you've heard uh, again and again, is a tree, uh, a tree made of nodes. So in the uh, diagram on the, on the right, you have a root node slash, and it has two sub nodes, which are named node at zero and node at one. And these nodes can themselves have sub nodes or child nodes. And the first uh, node, node at zero, has two child nodes, 
child node at zero and child node at one. Um, more or less, a node is typically used to represent a device or an IP block of your hardware. And then those nodes, they contain properties, which are kind of key value pairs. So you can see different types of properties. You can have properties that are associated to a string, to a list of strings, to a, a list of bytes. You can have Boolean properties, like the first child property that you can see has no specific value. It is just the fact that it is present that says this property is true. And if that property is not written in the device tree, it, it's false. Um, and also, uh, you can have properties that reference other nodes, and I'm going to get back to that. And those properties, they typically describe the characteristics of your devices. Um, so things like their memory address, interrupt line, and all this information that we will discuss throughout this webinar. Those nodes, they have a name, which is the part before the at. So for example, in node at zero, node is the name of that node. And they have a unit address, which is the part after the at. So at zero, the unit address is zero. And I'm going to get back to what we typically use as uh, the unit address and what it really means later on. In addition to having a name and a unit address, nodes can also have a label. And this is visible at the uh, bottom of the example here, where node at one as a label, node one, which is before the, um, um, the colon. And this um, uh, label can then be used to reference this node from other places in the device tree. And this is visible in the child node at zero. There is a, a property that is kind of stupidly named a reference to something equal. And the value of this property is ampersand node one. This is kind of a pointer. Uh, if you do C programming, you can really think of it as a pointer. It's a property that allows uh, to say, OK, I would like to say I have some kind of interaction with this other node in the device tree. Of course, we'll see examples of that being used in, in practice. Um, so what is important also to realize is that the device tree compiler is only doing syntax checking. Right? I have been able to compile, have you seen earlier my example, with these stupid properties values. Um, they are, um, um, this, the, the device tree compiler only verifies that syntactically it is correct, but it has no idea what nodes and what properties do make sense in a particular context. All right, so to know that we have the terminology of the device tree syntax in mind, Let's have a look at um, uh, kind of a top level look of the device tree. Then we'll uh, dive down into, into the details, but uh, to, to kind of get started, let's have an overall look of, of a device tree. So here I have kind of written a simplified example of the device tree for the DK2 Discovery Kit 2 platform. And you can see on the right side, um, the kind of the, the, the um, uh, limited subset of um, uh, IP cores and hardware parts that I will be describing. That is, of course, not the full system on chip. It has way more uh, IP blocks and, uh, and the board has way more hardware peripherals around. But well, for the sake of making that fit in a slide, um, uh, I'm kind of limiting myself to a subset of the hardware. And so the subset of the hardware I'm going to discuss are the CPU cores, dual A7, uh, the fact that it has memory attached to the SOC, that we have an interrupt controller, that we have an I2C controller that is used to communicate with an, an audio codec, and that we have an Ethernet Mac connected to a, an Ethernet Phi on the board. And again, this is very simplified. The audio codec is obviously connected to another IP block, uh, the audio interface of the SOC. This is not represented here, uh, just for the sake of, of simplicity. So on the, the left side, you've got the, the device tree itself. And I've kind of folded the, the nodes to make it fit on the slides. And uh, throughout the next slides, we will progressively unfold some of those nodes to understand what's uh, beneath those uh, child nodes of the, um, of the device tree. So the device tree starts with the root node. It has some address cells, size cells, properties, which I'm going to be covering in detail later. So I'm going to skip over that for now. And then we have this top level uh, model string. This is the string that gets displayed when you boot the system that we've seen earlier in the boot example. And then it has some compatible properties, and I'm also going to discuss that a bit later. But briefly, these are identifiers that 
identify the system as a whole. This is saying this is the Discovery Kit 2 platform and it is using an STM32MP157 SOC. And then we have subnodes. We have a subnode for uh, CPUs, uh, for the memory. We have a chosen subnode. Those subnodes, they are uh, defined by the base device tree specification, which I'm going to cover again in more detail a bit later. And then we have other subnodes, which are there to describe more of the hardware itself. So we have the uh, node for the interrupt controller, and then we have a node that describes the system on chip and all the IP blocks that it contains, such as the IceCrossy controller and the Ethernet controller. So let's have a look uh, node by node at what we have in there. But I think it's very important to keep in mind this, this top level view of what the device really is. It is really a representation of the hardware. So it is there to describe the different elements that we have in our system. CPU, memory, IP blocks in the system on chip and peripherals on the board. So the first node that I'm unfolding is the CPU's node, which has two sub nodes, one for each CPU, saying at which frequency they run and which specific type of CPU they are. So that's pretty simple, but that allows the Linux kernel to know, okay, I'm running on an SMP system, multi-processing system. So perhaps I need to bring up secondary cores. Uh, I also need to know what is the frequency. Maybe on some other platforms, there could be uh, ways of adjusting the frequency at runtime, the different, way, different things that the operating system needs to know about these uh, CPUs. The next node is the memory node, um, which is typically filled in by the firmware. So there can be a value set for the memory node in the device tree source that you write, but this is anyway going to be updated by the bootloader with the actual amount of RAM that is detected. So this property, this node and its reg uh, property is uh, giving the base physical address of the RAM and the size of the RAM that you have. Again, that allows Linux to start managing your physical memory, setting up the MMU, the page tables, and all these mechanisms. The next subnode chosen is an interesting um, node because it is not a node that is there to describe hardware. It is a node that is here to allow the firmware to communicate extra information to the operating system. And you've got two properties there. I'm going to start with the second one, STD out pass, which is telling the operating system what kind of standard output should be used for the operating system to communicate with the user? So this is typically a reference to some kind of serial port that, that is the one where with, that the kernel will use to display the boot logs and, and all those kernel messages. The other one, boot args, which is empty there, is going to be filled in by the firmware and it will contain the Linux kernel command line. So this is where you pass things like root equals slash dev mmc blk0 p3 to indicate where your root file system is, for example. So this is specified in the bootloader firmware, which needs to pass it to the kernel. And this is this pa information passing is done by patching the, the DTB at the bootloader level so that the kernel receives the kernel command line from the slash chosen slash boot rx property. Moving on, the next um, uh, part is the interrupt controller node, which for some reason in this um, uh, device tree has been put outside of the SOC node. I'm not exactly sure why that choice was made, but I mean, it, it works uh, to do it that way. Uh, so this is a node that describes one of the IP block of the system. Um, this STM32MP1 uh, system on chip uses the geek interrupt controller from ARM, um, and it describes where its registers are and different informations about it. Um, also, the SOC node has an interrupt parent property that reference it. I'm going to talk more about that later, but this is an example of this p handle and label mechanism. The interrupt controller node, uh, its name is interrupt controller. Its unit address is A0021000, and it has a label which is int C. And this label is used below in the SOC node which has an interrupt parent property, which says ampersand int c. This is a p handle, a pointer, that references to the interrupt controller using this int c label. Continuing, the next IP block 
is the I2C controller. So of course the system on chip has multiple of them, but I'm only showing one I2C. Um, the I2C controller, which has um, registers at 4001200, which is again the unit address of that node. The name is I2C, and it has a label uh, which is called I2C1. Number of properties in there, and obviously we'll get into the details of those properties. But what is really important there is that as a subnode, we have a description of what is connected to this I2C controller. And as you can see on the right side, this green box connected to the I2C controller is the audio codec, a CS, so I think it's a Serious Logic 42L51 audio codec. It is described as a subnode of the I2C controller. So we've got a node, a CS42L518 at 4A, um, which describes that audio codec. Moving on to the Ethernet controller, we have a node that describes the Ethernet controller itself, so the IP block in the system on chip. And as a subnode, we have here something a little bit more complex, uh, where we have a representation of the MDIO bus. So for those not too familiar with, um, with Ethernet and Mac and FIES, the MDIO bus is the bus that allows, the control bus that allows the Mac to communicate with the FI uh, for like control signaling. It's not the data, but just the control. And this MDIO bus um, has a sub node to represent the Ethernet FI itself. So the Ethernet FI at zero is the node that represents the FI and it gives an address to that file which happens to be um, address zero on the MDIO bus. So thanks to that information, the kernel can know, okay, there is an Ethernet controller and it has an MDIO bus controller which uh, connects me to an Ethernet file at this specific address, which the kernel wouldn't be able to guess by itself. So that gives kind of the top level view of what the, the type of uh, information the device tree contains and how it is overall organized. Um, these device tree source files, they are not monolithic. You don't write, you typically don't write a single huge DTS that describes your entire board and all the peripherals of your uh, SOC because that would be like overwhelming. And also uh, between two different boards that use the same system on chip, well, the description of all the hardware blocks inside the system on chip would be the same. So repeating the description over and over again in different source files would be, yeah, stupid and not very nice from a software engineering point of view, so we do have something better, which is device tree inheritance or inclusion, but I like better uh, to refer to it uh, as inheritance. So what we can do in fact is split our device tree source files into multiple files. We can have DTSI files, device tree source include, which contains some common information that is going to be used by multiple platforms. And then we have DTS files, device tree source, which includes one or several of those DTSI files. And only DTS files are accepted as input to DTC, but they can include an arbitrary number of other DTSI files. And so typically we use very heavily DTSI files to contain information such as describing the SOC and all the hardware blocks that it contains, because that information is going to be used for multiple boards using that system on chip. Or we also use DTSI to um, store common informations that are shared between uh, boards that are quite similar but not exactly the same. And we will have this example with the DK1 and DK2 because they are really, really similar. Uh, they share a lot of common aspects. They have just a few minor differences. Um, and so this mechanism of sharing uh, hardware description information is used to describe the DK1 and DK2. And then the DTS would typically contain kind of the board level information that is really specific to your custom hardware platform. And this inclusion mechanism works by overlaying the tree of the including file over the tree of the included file. So we've got file A and this file A gets included by file B, then whatever file B defines will take precedence over what file A defines. And we'll have plenty of examples of that. So that will allow file B to override things that are defined by file A, if need be. And this inclusion works uh, by using the C preprocessor sharp include directive. So in fact, what happens is that when you build your device tree, it gets passed to the C preprocessor. 
you will have multiple trees uh, next to one after the other, starting with slash, the root node, and the device recompiler will kind of fold that entirely and make sure that whatever comes last um, is kind of the one that has the ability of overriding what comes first. Let's have a look at examples to make that hopefully clear. And this is a simplified example. Um, the actual DTSI and DTS for the STM32 MP1 platforms are more complicated than shown here, and, and some of the next slide will, will show that. But this is enough to illustrate the mechanism. So we will, in many situations, have a, a device tree file that describes the system on chip, that's the one that you, the, you have on the left of the picture. Define definition of the STM32 MP157A SOC, stored in a file called STM32MP157.DTSI. Again, device resource include. And in there, we have plenty of definition, but I've only kept one, uh, which is the, the some part of the definition of the I2C controller. So it defines that the system on chip has some kind of I2C controller with certain registers, certain interrupts, and a status that is disabled which means yeah, this is IP block is, is not used. This device tree source include gets included by the file that is shown in the middle of the picture, which describes the discovery kit one platform. So this is a DTS file describing a physical board that includes that system on chip, as well as peripherals around. And those peripherals around, there is an audio codec connected on this I2C bus number one. So what we do, is that we extend this node, this I2C1 node, with additional properties. They describe various things, pin muxing, we're gonna get back later. Um, it describes a subnode, which describes the audio codec, and it also describes the status property. And you can see there's kind of a conflict here, right? Because the status property of that same node is described both on the DTSI and in the DTS. But because the DTS comes last, it's the one that will win. So on the right side of the picture, you can see what looks like the compiled DTB. Of course, in, in real, the DTB is a binary format. So this is more kind of the, the decompiled version of the DTB, if you wish. And it gets really the combination of bus information. So the final I2C1 node that the operating system will see uh, is the combination of the properties defined in the DTSI and in the DTS, so that it fully describes the hardware. All right. Um, so to um, do this overriding of properties and, and extension of, of existing nodes with more properties, there are two different ways of doing that. The first way, which was illustrated on the slide before and again here, is that you replicate in the DTS the hierarchy of nodes um, that go all the way down to the property you would like to override. So let's take the example that we have here. We have slash, SOC, and then a serial at 5C000 node, which has a property called status. This is in the DTS sign. Now in the DTS, we would like to really enable this UR controller. So what we do is we replicate that same hierarchy, slash, SOC, serial at 5C000, and we say status equal OK. This is going to override that status property so that the final DTB has this node with status OK. So this is one way of doing, of referring to which property of which node we would like to override. But we can also do it, uh, do achieve exactly the same thing with a different syntax, which is no more commonly used. Um, so in the DTSI, we have exactly the same. And you've noticed that this serial at 5C0000 node also has a label, useart1. Well, in the DTS, we can leverage this label using this syntax ampersand useart1 outside of any tree, outside of, we don't need to be inside slash and, and uh, curly brackets, just outside of any tree. The fact that we use this syntax ampersand useart1 says what properties we're specifying there should override whatever properties are inside the node whose label is useart1. And again, this is no kind of the, the most preferred solution. Um, kind of in the history of Linux kernel of, uh, of the device tree, I think the, the, the solution to the left was initially the most commonly used one. And over time, 
uh, people found that that the, the solution on the right was a bit lighter in, in, in what you need to write, a bit more compact. And so the one that is the most popular these days is the one you've got on the right. So now that we have seen this concept of device tree inheritance, let's have a look in practice at how this is used in the Linux kernel to represent the STM32MP1 hardware. And as you can see on the picture, it's not that simple, right? There are plenty of files involved. So I think it's, it makes sense spending a bit of time um, uh, describing what's going on there. First, we have divided this picture in two parts. The top part, uh, which is, uh, they are separated by the dash, this dashed line in the middle. The top part of the picture describes this uh, information. The uh, bottom part of the picture below this dashed line describes the board level information. So I'm going to start with the SOC level information at the top. On the left side, we have a first DTSI, which doesn't include any other file, which is kind of why I'm starting there. It's kind of the, the start of, of the story. Um, it's called STM32MP151.DTSI. If you remember this table at the beginning of our discussion, when I introduced the STM32MP1 family, the 151 is kind of the low end of the, the, the family. It has a single core A7, and it has, I would say, the base set of peripherals, which is already plentiful, but it, it's the one that has the, the, the least amount of peripherals. So this DTSI file describes this single A7, the Cortex-M4, and all the base peripherals that are common to all SOCs in this family. Then the, uh, the uh, next DTSI file, STM32MP153, which is just right below, is including this 151, because the 153 SOC is the same as the 151 plus extra peripherals. So we are including the description of the 151 and saying, okay, the 153, in addition to what the 151 provides, also provides a second Cortex-A7 and two CAN interfaces. So if you look at that 153.dtsi, it is not very long because it only includes the 151 and describes one additional CPU and two CAN interfaces. Then the story continues with the 157, which is again a superset of the 153, so it includes 153. But in addition to, to what the 153 has, it has a GPU and the DSI interface for display. So it has just two extra nodes in addition to what the 153 was providing. Then continuing on the SOC definition, there is um, the STM32MP15XC.dtsi, which describes just the crypto block. Uh, there is a crypto engine in, in this uh, SOC. But if you remember again the presentation of the, um, uh, the SOC family, for each SOC, 151, 153, 157, there is one version with security and one without security. And the one without security doesn't have the crypto engine. And so there is a separate device tree file that describes just the crypto engine. All right. Then we have a device tree file called STM32MP15-pin control, which describes pin maxing configurations that are common to all SOCs, all system on chips. And we're going to get back to pin maxing later in this discussion. Um, then we have on the right side, we have extra definition for pin control that depends on the package type that is used. Indeed, there are different packages, uh, physical packages like BGA packages that are available for the different system on chips that, that um, provides a different set of pins to the outside world. So there is some functionality that is not completely available if you have a too reduced package. And so this describes which GPIOs and which pins are exactly available depending on which package you're using. Then at the bottom of the picture, uh, we have at the, the, the center this STM32MP15XX-DKX.DTSI, which is a device tree that um, contains the definitions common to both the Discovery Kit 1 and the Discovery Kit 2 platforms. Indeed, as we say, they share a lot of uh, commonalities, so it makes sense to group that into a single DTSI. And finally, we have the DS DTS file, and I'm now seeing that my diagram is incorrect. Um, um, not enough review, I guess. The um, STM32157A uh, DK1 and DK2 files are DTS, not DTSI as written in the slides. So uh, please excuse me for that mistake. 
uh, will fix that up when publishing the slides. So these are really DTS files and this is quite critical in the explanation. These are really the files that you will build with the device recompiler. So what, uh, starting with the one to the left, DK1, um, what it does is it includes the 157 DTSI file. Indeed, this board is using the 157 SOC. So I'm including it so that my hardware description describes all the peripherals inside the system on chip. Then I'm also getting the definition from STM32 MP15 pin control to get all these pin maxing related configuration that we will discuss later. And I'm getting the pin control definition specific to the particular package uh, of the, the chip that I'm using. So it happens to be that the AC package is used on, on that particular board. And finally, I'm including the um, 15XX DKX DTSI, which again is uh, describing the common aspect between the two boards. And in addition to that, there will be some definitions maybe specific to the DK1. Going to the right of the picture, describing the DK2, we have a fairly similar story, but you can see there's an extra um, file being included, the 15XC. Indeed, the DK1 is using the A variant of the 157, which doesn't have security, so it doesn't have the crypto engine. The DK2 board is using the 157C variant of the uh, system on chip, which has security features, so it does have the crypto engine. So the description of the DK2 is also including this STM32MP15XC DTSI, which allows, well, the hardware description to also describe the crypto engine and allow the Linux scale and, and maybe the bootloader and other things to, to use it as well. Um, so that's how uh, multiple DTSI files gets all combined together to finally produce uh, a complete and accurate description of our Discovery Kit 1 and Discovery Kit 2 platforms. So the device tree um, has a bunch of design principles of what we put inside the device tree. It is there to describe hardware, like how the hardware is, not a configuration, not how I choose to use the hardware. And this is quite important um, and, and because there, there has been lots of discussions over the years on what sort of information we want to encode in the device tree and what information we don't want to encode. And because it needs to be operating system agnostic and use case agnostic, we don't want to know what is your particular use case or what is your particular configuration of the hardware. We want the device tree to just accurately and very objectively describe what is the hardware. There is this audio codec, it is connected to this I2C bus, this is something we can physically see by looking at the schematics. This is an objective view of the hardware. This goes into the device tree. However, if you're using this um, audio codec in, in, I don't know, this mode or this other mode, it is maybe your choice uh, for your particular application. And this is not uh, a description of the hardware and so does not belong in the device tree. As I mentioned, the device tree should be operating system agnostic. The device tree is used by Linux, but also by U-Boot, by FreeBSD, by the trusted firmware by Bearbox and other projects. So there normally shouldn't be uh, OS specific uh, details in the device tree. Also the device tree should describe the integration of the hardware components and not the internal details of those hardware components. As we've seen in the various examples, what we're describing is we have an I2C controller and it's connected to an, an, uh, an audio codec, for example, or a touchscreen controller. So we describe how they are connected together. It is on this particular bus, maybe the audio codec has a reset GPIO, and it is connected to this audio interface of the system on chip. This is how uh, components are connected together. But we don't describe the inside of those uh, components. So we're not gonna describe, I don't know, the list of registers of your, um, of your audio codec in the device tree, at, at which offset and which bit mask they have and so on. This doesn't fit in the device tree because this is the internal details of controlling the audio codec and not the description of the, uh, the integra in integration interaction between the different components. Of course, like all beautiful design principles, these principles are sometimes violated. We find sometimes things that are not completely hardware description, sometimes things that are not completely OS agnostic, sometimes things that, are, um, that go a little bit beyond that describing the hardware inter integ integration and interaction. But still, design principles are there to kind of give um, a guideline. Sometimes we deviate a bit from the guideline, but that gives um, kind of um, a good um, a direction where to go.
So how do we know what to write in the device tree? What nodes and what properties exist and which one should I use for a given hardware platform? And the first foundational document that we have are the device tree specifications. They are available on devicetree.org and they define really um, what is a device tree, what are the top level nodes, what they should contain, uh, a number of common properties. So this is a very important um, body of documentation, but this is not sufficient to describe the wide variety of hardware that we have, right? This spec is not updated every time a new auto codec shows up, every time a new SOC shows up, every time a new IP block shows up. So this device tree spec is really kind of foundation. And on top of that foundation, we have what we call device tree bindings, which are documents that each specify how a given piece of hardware should be described in the device tree. So whenever a new uh, piece of hardware gets supported by Ubud or Linux or something like that, we have to also contribute um, a device tree binding document that indicates what are the properties that are expected, what are the possible values of those properties to describe a given piece of hardware. So you contribute a new audio codec driver, you contribute C code, but you also contribute a device tree binding document that gives uh, details on what is the proper device tree representation for this audio codec. These bindings, um, very much like the Linux kernel source code, serves as kind of the reference canonical location for device tree files. The device tree bindings are also located today in the Linux kernel source code. So if you go in documentation, device tree bindings in your favorite Linux kernel tree, you will find all the um, uh, device tree binding documents and there are plenty of them. These bindings are reviewed by a, a team of kernel maintainers who kind of ensure that they, the bindings that you submit comply with the general guidelines of the device tree design principles that I illustrated before. And as of today, we have two formats for documenting device tree bindings. The legacy way, which is kind of a human readable document, and the new norm, which are YAML written specification. So let's have a look at a couple of examples. Uh, for the old style, where it was just a, hum a text format, human readable uh, document, uh, I took the example of an IP from ST, but this IP is not used on the STM uh, 32 MP1 simply because on STM32 MP1 they have converted all the device tree bindings to the new format. Uh, they are good open source citizens, so they've done this job already. Uh, but I still wanted to illustrate this old binding format that you can still find for other peripherals and other devices. Um, so as you can see, this is re really just human readable text, right? It says what are the required properties: compatible, rank, address cells, size cells, interrupts, clock rate, and what are the properties and what you should put in them. So this is really important if you have one of those IP blocks, thanks to that document, you know which properties need to be used. There are optional properties, so you can have them or not. And then on the right side, you've got an example that shows how usually this device tree binding gets used in a particular uh, device tree file. The problem with this format is that it is nice for humans, it is nicely readable, but it is not machine parsable. And as I mentioned before, um, DTC only does syntactic checking. It only verifies that overall the syntax of your device tree makes sense, but it doesn't have the knowledge of which nodes, which property makes sense in a particular context and which values are, um, are correct for a particular property. And this is something that the kernel developers and generally the device tree community wanted to improve on. And a key to make that possible is to have machine parsable device tree binding documentations. And so that's why nowadays Device tree bindings are written in YAML, uh, so very popular uh, data uh, representation format. It makes the device tree binding maybe a little bit less nice for human beings to read, but it makes it machine parsable, which means we can have tooling to validate device tree, and I'm going to get back to that. So um, in this uh, YAML file, we can find pretty much the same information as in the previous text file, which properties are available, what values are possible, how many of values are uh, possible for the different properties, uh, which properties are required, and so on. And it also has examples to, again, make it kind of easier to get uh, a feeling on, on um, how to use a particular uh, device rep representation for a given piece of hardware. Um, again, DTC does only syntactic, um, syntactic validation, and thanks to YAML bindings, we can do semantic validation. 
uh, for example, if you have a piece of uh, device tree that um, uses a compatible string of st, stm32mp15-i2c, we know that this binding applies. And so we can check that you have all the required uh, properties, that they have correct value and, and so on. And this is integrated in the Linux kernel build system at least, possibly in, in, in others as well, but at least in the Linux kernel, it, it's well integrated. There is a uh, DT binding check, which is validating the binding themselves. It's just validating that the YAML file is, is correct YAML and that it can be parsed and that it make, makes sense. And then there is a DTBs check rule uh, that you can use as part of the kernel build system that will validate the D device tree files that describe the platforms that you have selected against the bindings. You can also reduce the scope of that validation to just one YAML file that maybe you are writing, you're busy writing, you don't want to do the full validation of the entire world. Uh, you want to validate again a single binding. You can also do that as well with DT schema files. So this is extract tooling. Um, and and um, kind of, this is still a very active area of development, right? The bindings are progressively converted to YAML and the tooling is, is being improved and, and so on. So this is kind of a, maybe not new, but still in very active development area of um, device tree development. So now it's time to look at actual properties of the device tree. And the first property that we're going to discuss, and is probably the most important one, is the compatible property. This compatible property, it is a list of string from the most specific to the less specific. Um, and it describes the specific binding to which the node complies. So it's going to be the, the identifier to know what this node is representing as a hardware platform. And so which device tree binding you rely on to represent this particular piece of hardware. And the device tree spec says that it uniquely identifies the programming model of the device. So if you've got a piece of um, hardware block, it has a bunch of register, maybe offset 0, 4, um, 12, 8, 12, 16, etc. And those registers, they have bit fields uh, that have certain meaning to control the IP block. Uh, well, this is the programming model of the device, right? This is what defines how you are going to work with that specific hardware block. And practically speaking, this compatible string is used by the operating system to identify the appropriate driver for the device. Indeed, given a certain programming model, a certain set of register, a certain set of bit fields that have a certain effect on the hardware block, you write a corresponding driver that uses that programming model to do whatever needs to be done with the device. So that compatible string is going to be the key to associate a node in the device tree with a driver in the Linux kernel or in U-Boot or in Bearbox. And when it describes real hardware, the typical form of a compatible string is vendor, comma, model of the hardware. And you've got plenty of examples below, like ARM, comma, ARM v7 timer is the compatible string to describe the uh, timer from ARM found in uh, many ARM v7 platforms. And this is string is found in device tree files and in the driver for the uh, ARM v7 timer. The second example is interesting because it has two entries uh, in this uh, compatible uh, list. Again, I said earlier in the slide, from the most specific to the less specific. This allows, depending on the capability of the operating system, to have maybe better support for um, an extra functionality that a given hardware block is providing uh, compared to a less efficient version of the same hardware block. So in that case, it is uh, saying, okay, this is the Ethernet Mac from Designware that is bundled into the STM32 MP1. But I mean, if you don't have the actual support for this, um, if you just support SNPS uh, Designware Mac 4.20a, it should do fine as well. So the Linux kernel and generally other operating systems, they will match against the first compatible string and see if there is a driver that is available. And if they uh, don't find any, uh, they will try with the second compatible string. The two last compatible strings, they don't have this um, um, vendor comma model because they are not really tied to a specific hardware model. For example, the first one describes a fixed regulator. So this is here to just say, okay, my hardware has a fixed voltage uh, line that provides maybe five volt um, or 3.3 volt or something like that. 
so it's not really something that comes from a given manufacturer it's just to express that in your in your hardware you've got some um, input voltage at, at a given uh, a given voltage level a gpio keys is a, a driver of Linux that allows to turn a gpio into a, a keyboard with just with just one key uh, so again this is not a Kind of a specific piece of hardware from a given vendor it's just an abstraction of the kernel that allows to take one gpio and turn it into a regular keyboard input device there's a special value for a compatible um, simple bus which indicates that all the sub nodes are memory mapped devices and we're gonna see that in the, uh, the next example so in in linux um, this compatible string is again used to identify the corresponding driver so when you take a device tree, all the top-level nodes that have a compatible string and all the sub-nodes of simple bus will be turned by the Linux kernel at boot time into platform devices. So if you look at the, the example on the right side, timer is a top-level uh, node with a compatible string. UART at 1000 and i 2 c at 2000 are child nodes of simple bus. So when the kernel boots up, gets this DTB from the bootloader, parses it, it will identify those three nodes and will say, okay, I'm gonna create a platform device corresponding to each of those uh, nodes. Um, then for the sub nodes of I2C controllers, the Linux kernel is going to create I2C devices. For sub nodes of SPI controller is gonna create I, uh, SPI devices. And then each driver in the kernel has a table of compatible strings it supports which is a table of OF device ID entries. And when a node in the device tree matches one of the entry in that table, then they are kind of bind together, right? And we have a device, we have a driver, and it turns out that this device matches what the driver is capable of managing. So we kind of bind them together, and this way the driver knows, okay, I'm now taking care of that particular device. First example, um, the STM32 um, UART controller driver. It, um, it registers into the kernel a platform driver structure, which in, inside it has an OF match table um, property, or a member, I should say, because that's C code, which points to this STM32 match table at the beginning of the example. And you can see it matches three different compatible strings. So if there is a node in the device tree that matches one of those three values, then this node and the platform device that gets created based on that information will be tied uh, with that platform driver and the probe function of that driver is going to be called as a result of that. And of course we can have like four different nodes in the device tree with the same compatible string uh, calling four times the probe function of this driver because we have four different UI controllers in that, um, in that particular piece of hardware. Another example, uh, just to illustrate with another uh, type of bus that the logic is exactly the same. Um, the audio codec that we have on the uh, Discovery Kit platforms uh, is on I2C. So we have an I2C driver. This I2C driver has an OF match table. And again, you can see this OF uh, terminology. It stands for open firmware, which points to uh, CS42 L51 OF match that we have at the top of the, the picture. And this one supports just one compatible string, which is Cirrus-CS42L51. So again, when an I2C device in the device tree is encountered and it has a compatible string Cirrus-CS42L51, um, and it will be, be kind of tied with this driver and the probe function of the driver will be called. The next property that is important is reg. Um, it's probably the most important after compatible. Um, it is used for uh, different types of devices, but it has different meanings de depending on the type of device that you're describing. For memory map devices, it contains the base physical address and size of the memory map registers, and it can have several entries for multiple uh, register areas. So here is an extract from the um, sound uh, interface of the uh, MP1. Uh, it has two register areas. Uh, one that starts as a 5002700 for just a size of four bytes, so just one register. And there's another one at 500273F0, which is uh, 16 bytes in length. For I2C devices, this reg property has a different meaning. It's same property, but different meaning. 
it provides the address of the device on the I2C bus. So in this case, there's only one entry, um, which is there, which is the, the I2C address of the device. For SPI devices, it is the um, uh, chip select number. Uh, so here is an example of the um, Quad Spy interface on, on the MP1 that on one given board is used to connect to two different flashes um, connected to the same um, Quad Spy controller, but using two different chip selects, chip select zero, chip select one, and the rec property indicates which chip select is being used. Um, the unit address, um, which is the part after the at in, in the node name, uh, must match the address of the first reg entry. So if you scroll back in the different um, examples I had before, like here at zero, it is kind of matching with reg equals zero. At one, matching with reg equal one. Or here at 5002700 is matching the first reg property. Um, then I need to introduce the concept of cells. Integer values in device tree are represented as 32-bit integers called cells. So on the right side of the slide, this property called foo is a property that contains just one cell, the value dead beef, which could have been bad cafe or something like that. So if you want to encode a 64-bit value, you really need two cells. And here we have dead beef and bad cafe. And they are properties that indicate how many cells are expected in various other properties. So for example, the address cells and size cells property and this sharp at the beginning is not making them comments. Um, it is perhaps not very clear on, on, the, on the diagram which puts them in, in, in green, uh, but they are not comments, they are actual properties. Just their name happens to start with the sharp that says number of address cells equal one, number of science cells equal one. So what these two properties mean is they indicate the number of cells that are used in the right property of child nodes, right? So here in the SOC node, we have address cells one, size cells one. So it means that in every child node of that SOC node, we want the right property to have one cell to indicate the address of a memory map area and one cell to indicate the size of that area. And indeed, in I2C at F1001000, 000, we have a reg property with one cell for the address, one cell for the size. And then we are overriding these values saying for my own child nodes, the address cell is no one and the size cell is zero. Indeed, I am an I2C controller and the child nodes of me will not be memory map devices, but I2C devices. And for I2C devices, the reg property has just one entry, one cell, which indicates the address of the device. We have this similar concept with many other things uh, like interrupt and we will get uh, back to interrupt examples in, in a moment. Like here we say this interrupt controller says interrupt cells equal two, which means that any nodes that refer to that interrupt controller needs to use two cells in its interrupt property. And indeed you can see the I2C at F1001000 000, 000, node. It has an interrupt property with two cells, 12, 24. That's two cells which matches what the uh, interrupt controller node expects. And we have that for clock cells, GPIO cells, PHY cells, PWM cells, DMA cells, and, and so on. Another property that is key, but much more simple, is status, which we've already encountered. It tells if the device is really in use or not. So it can be okay or okay, which means the device is really in use, and any other value, but by convention we use disabled, then the device is not in use. And basically in Linux, it controls if a device is instantiated or not. So when the, the kernel kind of parses through your DTB, if a given node has a status disabled, kind of the kernel kind of skips it and doesn't even instantiate a device for it. So it will not be used. A device that has status OK will really be used and there will be an instance of that device, which hopefully will be tied to a driver thanks to the compatible string. So what happens is that in most DTSI files that describe SOCs, most of the peripherals and devices are uh, defined with status disabled and it is on a poor pair board basis that we are going to say okay on my particular board i am using i2c controller one and five so i enable those two ones but i leave all the other ones not enabled because i don't use them that's the idea of that property interrupts uh, so we have nodes describing interrupt controllers 
Um, the um, top level node on the right side describes an interrupt controller, which is the, um, the geek from R. And it says, um, I need three cells to describe interrupts. Uh, I am an interrupt controller, which is defined by this Boolean property, interrupt-controller. And because this is a hardware block, it has registers. And then uh, below, we've got um, two devices that are connected to this interrupt controller. They have interrupt lines that go to this interrupt controller. And we describe, again, this integration between hardware blocks in the system on chip. And to describe which interrupt a given device is using, uh, we have two different ways. We can use interrupts and interrupt parent, or we can use interrupts extended. So interrupts specifies the interrupt that we need to use. And it has three cells, right? Matching the number of interrupt cells. Here the cells are geek spy, which is kind of the type of interrupt, 36, the number of the interrupt line, and RQ type level high, which says, okay, this interrupt is like um, uh, happening at, at the high level. Um, and the information that tells the system to which interrupt controller this interrupt belongs is the interrupt parent property. And it doesn't have to be filled in for every device because the, um, the kernel uh, parses recursively the parents of the current node. So in this specific case, the SOC node says interrupt parent equal person NC. So it's a P handle pointing to the interrupt controller node. And this statement says for all the nodes below that, unless they override this information, every interrupt pro property is going to be um, referring to that particular interrupt controller. The interrupts extended um, property um, is kind of an improved way, I would say, which combines the two information. You can see in the example of the mailbox. So that's a mailbox that is used on, on uh, MP1 to, for example, communicate between the Cortex A7 and the Cortex M4. Um, it has different interrupts. Two of them are from the geek, uh, which is represented by the INC uh, label. But another one is from another interrupt controller called XI, which I couldn't represent on the, on the slide for, uh, due to the lack of, of space, but that's another interrupt controller. So this property allows to provide both which interrupt controller and which interrupt we are uh, using for a particular hardware device. And this story goes on and on for many other resources, clocks, DMAs, reset lines, and so on. And so on the right side, I took an example of an SPI um, controller on the MP1. It has a property called clocks, which refers to RCC, which is a node um, at the top of the slide, which is the clock controller of the MP1. And it says the SPI controller is using the clock named SPI3 underscore K. This um, uh, SPI controller also has a reset line, of course, internal to the system on chip, right? We are inside the chip, not, not around on the board, but there are reset signals. And this reset signal is also controlled by the RCC, which I think is something like reset and clock control or something like that. And uh, so we say my reset um, uh, signal is controlled by RCC and it is the reset line or reset signal spy3 underscore r. And also as a spy controller, I can use um, DMA channels from a separate DMA controller. So there is a node DMA mux1, which describes um, a DMA controller. And the DMA's property of the spy controller at the bottom of the picture is saying, okay, I can use channel 61 and 62 of that DMA controller with those particular flags and, 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 and inf additional information. You can see again, um, sharp DMA cells equal three. So whenever we make a reference to that particular DMA controller, we need to specify three uh, cells in those references. So that's why we have 61, OX400 and OX5. So this model is, is really repeated for many other uh, type of resources. Um, you can find that for uh, GPIOs, for uh, uh, regulators, for many other resources that you're present in a device tree. Um, another thing that you will often find are dash names properties, uh, which are associated to a corresponding type of, of resources like interrupts, interrupt names, clocks, clock names, um, um, you can find reset, reset names, DMA, DMA names. And what these properties do is they simply give a name to uh, the different resources. So for example, in here, the interrupts, you can say, okay, interrupt zero uh, for that device is 0590 and interrupt one is 070. 
or maybe a bit more human readable, you can use, say, okay, the Mac RQ and the Mac uh, PMT interrupt, and that allows the driver, for example, to query, okay, what is the interrupt Mac RQ? What is the interrupt Mac PMT? So it really just associates a name to one of the different resources used by that specific hardware block. Um, another part that is often confusing in the device tree um, is pin boxing. Uh, and, and their description in, in DT. So for most modern SOCs, including the MP1, we have more features in the SOC than we have pins to expose the, those features to the outside world. And due to that, we use pin maxing, which is a pretty simple technique that consists in saying, okay, a given pin that goes outside of the, the, the processor package can be used either for a function or another function or another function, but it's kind of mutually exclusive. And this is illustrated on, on the right side, where we have two pins that go outside of our package. And for example, the first pin can either be used as a GPIO, or uh, as the RX line of a UART controller, or as the MISO signal of an SPI controller, or as the clock line of an I2C controller. Um, but it cannot do um, several of those functions at the same time. And there's a specific hardware block in the system on chip that controls this muxing. So this is software configurable most of the time. And therefore, the device tree is here to describe which pin configurations are possible and which one you use in practice in your board um, to well use the, uh, the features uh, inside the system on chip that you need to use. On MP1, it looks like this. In the DTSI, we have two uh, nodes, pin control and pin control Z, that describes two pin max controllers. So for different reasons, instead of being just a single drivers, they, they, they were separated. Um, the first one pin control is the, the, the biggest one. It is the one that supports most of the pins. And as you can see, as sub node, it has all the banks of GPIO, GPIO bank A, B, C, D, E, F, and I think that it has a bunch of others. Uh, the last one pin control Z is only controlling a, a smaller bank of GPIO. And um, so this is in the DTSI file. And then we've got um, another file that gives the uh, definition of the pin muxing um, configurations that are possible. So this is just a small part of that file. It is much longer than that. But for example, the first part, I square C1 pins A, is showing one possible configuration to get the uh, I square C controller one signals outside of the chip. And it is configuring, for example, pin T, the, sorry, D12 in function AF5 and pin F15 in function AF15. And to read that correctly, you need the data sheet. Um, and the, if you look at D12, uh, this is um, um, visible in that, in that table, uh, PD12. And if you look to column named AF5 for PD12, it's matching it's giving the function i square c1 scl. So it means that if you configure the pin muxing uh, for that pin to say, I would like function number five, then the, the pad of your SOC PD12 will allow you to use the clock of the i square c controller one. So this is exactly what this configuration is describing, is saying I would like PD12 to be configured to give me access to the clock signal of that I2C controller. So this is just uh, defining this possible configuration. Then you need to say, I would like to use that configuration. And this is done uh, usually at the board level, because that's at the board level that you say, okay, the I2C1 signals are coming out of those two different pins on, on, the, um, on the processor. And so you refer to the pin control configuration using pin control zero, pin control one, pin control X properties. You can see pin control zero is equal to I square C one pins A. This is the label of the I square C, uh, I square C one pins A uh, node that we see in this DTSI file. And this is going to tell the kernel when you bring up the driver for this I square C controller, you need to configure the pins in that particular state. The zero one, pin control zero, pin control one, they define mutually exclusive states for the pins. And pin control names is giving names to dif different states. So here we have two states, default and sleep. And when a kernel driver um, is initialized, automatically the default state is, is set, is, um, is 
configured. So it's going to be I score C1 pins A. But then the driver can, on its own decision, decide to switch to different, uh, different states, the pins. And here, the motivation for using uh, different pin states is that when the platform goes into suspend, into a low power mode, we need to reconfigure the pins to reduce the power consumption of the platform. And um, this is what the slip state allows to do. It's a different configuration for those pins. And the driver, when the platform is going to go into low power state, will uh, select the slip state instead of the default. And when the platform comes back from a low power state, it will restore the default configuration for the pins. And we'll conclude that, um, that webinar with um, a, a very simple example of connecting an LED and an I2C device to the Discovery Kit 1 platform. Uh, just to kind of show in practice how this device tree knowledge can be used. So to start, we're going to create our own DTS. Uh, which is stm32mp157adk1-custom.dts and we're simply making it you include the dk1.dts which is already available in the upstream Linux kernel. Then we modify arch arm boot dts make file to ask the Linux kernel build system to also build this dts into a dtb. This is, it is this make file that tells depending on which platform is, um, is selected in the Linux kernel configuration which DTBs are going to be produced. So just next to the DK1 DTB, we add our DK1 custom DTB. And then if we build the kernel or simply just rebuild the device tree using make DTBs, we can see the kernel build system invoking the device tree compiler, DTC, to produce DK1 custom. Of course, at this point, because this custom file is only including DK1.DTS, using one or the other doesn't make any difference, right? So you can try that out, boot with dk1-custom, you will see the exact same result as if you were using dk1.dts. Now, if we want to add an LED, um, what we're gonna do? Uh, first, we need to see how to connect it. And this is in uh, an extract from the, the data sheet for the board. It says that connectors CN14, which are at the back of the board, they are the Arduino connectors. Um, pin three of that connector, um, is in fact the signal PE1 of the system on chip. So on the left side, I am adding an extra node in the device tree called LEDs, which uses a Linux kernel driver called GPIO LEDs, hence the compatible string. And this driver is instantiating one LED for each sub-node of that node. Um, and it gives a name to each of those nodes. So the, the label here is webinar for my LED. And I'm saying I'm using the GPIO of bank E number one, and it's active high. And then by just doing this, I boot my kernel, and it shows in sys class LEDs that the GPIO led drivers of the next scale has recognized my new device. I have a new folder, sys class LEDs webinar, and I can control my LED, like writing 255 into the brightness file will uh, light up my LED, as can be seen on the picture. Another example, connecting an I2C sensor. Uh, I have this small BME 280, I think it's a temperature, humidity and pressure sensor. Um, and I would like to connect it to the uh, DK1 platform. Again, I look in the um, uh, data sheet of the board and in one of those Arduino connectors, CN13, pins 9 and 10 uh, allow me to get access to the I2C5 data and I2C5 clock signals. So I am going to um, take that information into my uh, device tree on the left side. I'm going to say the I2C5 controller, I extend that node, I enable it, status OK, specify a frequency of operation, 100 kilohertz, then the uh, pin maxing configuration for default state and slip state, and those Pin maxing configuration, they were already defined in the um, MP1 device tree files, so I didn't have to, to do it by myself. And then as a sub node, I described the sensor itself, which is uh, a sensor that already has a driver in the Linux kernel. That driver uses the Bosch comma BME 280 compatible string, and I provide its um, slave I2C address as the rec property, which is OX76. With that done, I build my device tree. I boot and I go into the shell and this Bosch BME280 is part of the IIO subsystem in the Linux kernel, which is used for industrial 
uh, input output devices. And so if I go into sysbus IIO, I can find an in temp input file, which I can simply cat and find out it's 24 degrees. That's not actually the temperature nowadays in Toulouse, but it's, it's uh, an example. And, and of course, you can also access the humidity measurements, uh, the pressure measurements, and so on. So that really is five, well, six, seven lines of device tree showing how you can describe an, an, an additional I2C device connected to your DK1 platform. If you want more details on that specific example, I have a much more detailed blog post, um, which is linked there, which describes the entire process for doing this. And this blog post is in fact part of a larger series of blog posts that we've wrote um, that describes how to uh, build step-by-step -step an embedded Linux system for the MP1 platform using BuildRoot from the basics all the way up to having a Qt5 application running on the target, receiving measurements from an I2C sensor, uh, doing remote updates of the system, and so on. So I encourage you, if you're interested, to uh, take a look at that uh, series of blog posts. It was long, in fact, um, longer than I expected, um, but in fact, there's more. Um, there's lots of other device free topics that we couldn't cover in the time that we had. Uh, the range property, for example, for address translation is a more advanced topic. There are more complex device tree bindings for audio, display, camera devices where multiple um, nodes of the device tree connect to each other to describe a pipeline of, um, of devices. Uh, we could have discussed the Linux kernel API for uh, querying the device tree, which are used in, in kernel drivers. We could have looked at the U-Boot tooling for manipulating the device tree. There is an FDT common in U-Boot that you can use to print, modify the device tree before handing it over to the kernel. We could have talked about device tree overlays and plenty of other topics. But again, it's already been an hour and 45 minutes. So we get to put an end to this, uh, to this webinar. I've put together a list of resources, uh, the device tree specs, the device tree bindings, uh, my former device tree for dummies talk for a different perspective on the device tree. There is a very good um, uh, page on the uh, Linux wiki on device tree with plenty of resources. And also on the Linux wiki, there is a nice page that references all the talks that were given in the past on device tree topics. So very good uh, source for getting more detailed information on this, uh, on this topic. So to conclude on the device tree, it's a representation of non discoverable hardware. So you will typically not describe your USB and PCI devices in the device tree, but everything else that is non discoverable It's a tree of nodes with properties. We have standardization of the device tree contents based on the device tree binding. And it's overall a new description language that has lots of properties, sometimes complex bindings. So it's definitely something new to learn for uh, people jumping into the embedded Linux world. But it's used in numerous CPU architectures and it's basically widely used today uh, for Linux but also outside of Linux as we've seen with U-Boot and the ARM trusted firmware. So it's definitely a must know for all embedded Linux developers and I kind of hope that this webinar will have helped you um, get the basic knowledge that you need to um, start working with the device tree or a better understanding if you've already started playing with device trees. To conclude about Bootlin, I just want to um, Make sure you keep in mind that we are a company providing uh, consulting services, having expertise in embedded Linux. We have uh, training um, services, including trainings that are available online. And we have uh, trainings coming up next month. Uh, registration is open, so uh, feel free to check that out. We also have engineering services. We can help you and your companies or customers uh, put uh, embedded Linux into your custom hardware or solve problems and help you in solving those problems. We heavily contribute to open source, and I think this webinar is another example. The slides are all available under a Creative Commons license, so don't hesitate to contact us if you uh, want to get in touch. And I also want to thank a lot ST for supporting the organization of this webinar. And I think we are now ready for taking a bunch of uh, questions, so I'm going to switch the scene to something else and hopefully uh, get the, um, the questions in front of me. So just give me a moment. All right, so let's see what sort of questions do we have here. Um, so there, there is a kind of a latency between um, uh, you and, and my answers. So I'm, I'm going to see if there are a, a few questions coming up on the chat. I don't immediately see any, but uh, hopefully there will be a bunch. I see there's been lots of discussion in the chat. 
I see, thank you. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad. I hope that was been useful. Any um, questions? Or maybe um, there's been uh, questions before. Um, I'm just picking up um, some random question. Can the peripheral be turned off through DT? Um, I would not really, well, it, it depends on what you think, right? There is, this, there is this status property, which is there to statically say this device is not present. Um, so this really, it, it doesn't really turn off the device in the in, in runtime sense of, of, uh, of, um, of things, right? It just says this device doesn't exist at all. So the kernel has not even any notion that this device might exist. If you're rather talking about uh, turning on and off devices at runtime, for example, to save power, then the device tree is not there at all for that. There are other mechanisms in Linux to, to achieve that kind of, uh, of logic. The device tree is only here to describe um, hardware. So the piece of hardware is there. Whether at some point you would like that hardware to be on and off is, is not something that is part of the uh, hardware description. Let's scroll down and see. Um, and so remaining question was about one DTB per boot stage and why this was needed. Uh, so indeed, we have seen um, that uh, TFA uh, is using the device tree, then U-boot is using the device tree, and then Linux kernel is using the device tree. So why is this needed? Uh, first, because every stage needs some information about the hardware, right? Your uh, TFA, uh, wants to output some messages on the serial console. So it needs to know which UART controller to use, at what addresses uh, is available the UART controller. Uh, so even something really early in the boot chain needs to have some basic view of the hardware. It might be a less complex and less complete view than what the Linux kernel needs. I would say typically your uh, firmware most likely doesn't need to know about your camera and display and things like that. Um, so it, can do with a, probably a, a simpler and, and reduced view of the hardware, but nevertheless, it does need to know details about the hardware. Similarly, your U-boot is capable of doing networking, loading from SD card, from EMMC, from NAND flash, so it needs to know what your hardware looks like. So every piece of the boot chain needs to have a representation of, um, of the hardware topology. No, perhaps the, the, the other question that can come up is why do we have a duplication of that device tree in those different projects? And as I mentioned, I think this is something that has been often discussed in the community, kind of splitting out the device tree files from the kernel into some central um, US neutral project, but that has never happened so far. Um, but that would be, uh, would be nice. Um, is there a reason DT isn't popular on microcontroller architecture as Zephyr uses it. So I was going to bring up that Zephyr uses it. Um, I'm not sure why it's not so popular on microcontroller architecture. Um, maybe because um, on microcontroller, the mindset is, is perhaps a bit less on reusability, uh, right? The point of DT is to create a, a bootloader or a kernel that is relatively hardware independent and it is the device tree that feeds in the, the hardware topology to the operating system. And I think in most microcontroller applications, you have a much more like uh, uh, tight coupling between the application and the hardware itself. So it, it's not such a big deal to have hardware specific details creeping all the way up to the applications. I, I'd say uh, something like that. Um, when building U-Boot and Linux for an embedded Linux platform, does the device tree for U-Boot override the device tree for Linux? Um, so I would say no. Um, U-Boot is using its own device tree and Linux is using its own. U-Boot is able to uh, override, patch, adjust the device tree that will be passed to Linux but not based on, on the, the device tree that U-Boot itself is using, right? You can use uh, device tree A for U-Boot and then pass a device tree B to the Linux kernel. Of course, they have to be kind of, they have to make sense, right? For the particular hardware platform you run on, but there is no relationship or no direct relationship between the device tree that U-Boot is using for its own business and the device tree that you are passing over to the Linux kernel. And in fact, there are platforms where U-Boot is not even using the device tree for its own business, but is capable of passing a device tree to the Linux kernel. 
Um, is the bootloader using the DTP in any way except just passing it to the kernel? Um, so yes, um, in, if the uBoot is uh, on the platform that uses the device tree for hardware description, then the bootloader will use it exactly for the same purpose as the kernel does, to understand the topology of your hardware. Uh, as I've mentioned, your bootloader interacts with you over the serial port. It is able to load data over an SD card or through over an eMMC over the network. And to provide those capabilities, it, knows, it needs to know a lot of details about your hardware. And these details are provided by the uh, device tree. It used to be provided in hard-coded C data structures, and it is still the case on some platforms in Uboot. But for most of the more modern ARM uh, SOCs, which STM32MP1 is part of, um, uh, leveraging the device tree even at the U-boot level is possible. But it is quite distinct from whether it is used by the uh, kernel or not. Right? You can have, again, a platform where the kernel uses the device tree, but not U-boot. Or you can have a platform where both the kernel and U-boot use the device tree for each for their own business. Um, is there a kind of standard for device binding for a class of devices as, for example, i squared controller as far as I understand, the dev binding must have deep knowledge of the dev driver. Um, so when you write the binding, um, you typically do so in parallel to writing the driver. It is generally the, the, the developer of the driver that also defines what information needs to be uh, present in the device stream binding and will therefore write the binding as well. Um, I don't think there is really a, a kind of standard binding, but they are often common properties uh, which are shared. So if you look at YAML files for I2C controllers, they will include a common I2C YAML, which defines very common properties. For example, um, the clock dash frequency property in I2C controllers is a standardized property that describes at which frequency this I2C bus will operate. Um, so, and, and this is also the case for other uh, subsystems, other type of buses that define standard properties, which um, the, um, the bindings for specific controllers are kind of forced to use in a way. I mean, if you kind of reinvent clock frequency, but name it frequency dash clock, and you pass your binding through the review of the device tree binding maintainer, they will probably reject it and ask you to use the standard property. So yes, there is some kind of standardization happening, I would say. Um, and what happens if we describe a peripheral that doesn't exist on your SOC in the DTS and use the obtained DTB on your machine? Well, um, uh, it's gonna depend, right? The driver will be probed and it will try to talk to that device and so what happens is, it depends really, uh, if it's a memory map device and the driver attempts to, to write to a location that really doesn't exist, then you might get a kernel panic, um, right? Uh, if it's an i 2 c device uh, and the, there is nothing at that i 2 c address, then the driver will try to talk to the device, will fail and simply probably will fail initialize and will continue booting. So I would say it kind of, of depends. Uh, is there any relationship between device tree and Yocto? Um, well, I would say no. Um, Yocto is an embedded Linux build system, so it's a, an integration tool that is capable of building the different software components of your embedded Linux systems. Um, Buzzybox, your C library, your toolchain, Qt, the kernel, your bootloader. So as such, there is kind of a relationship because uh, Yocto is capable of building Linux, of building U-boots, including the device tree files that they might contain. But there is no, I would say, direct relationship between, uh, between the two. How can we easily know the modification ban done by U-boot in the FDT passed to the kernel? Um, that is a good question. And in fact, the, um, um, the Sys class firmware um, entry that you have in SysFS on Linux is for that very nice because it allows you to see exactly the FDT that Linux has, has seen at boot time, right? Including the modification that could have been made by U-boot. So this is really important to um, debug maybe the, the, the slight differences that might be between, that might exist between the DTB that you pass to U-boot and the actual DTB that the Linux kernel has seen. Um, so, 
Could you give us more details about slip pin control? Um, is it used by Linux directly to save power? Um, so, the, um, depending on the system on chip you're using, the uh, pinmux configuration can be adjusted um, to save power. So this is really depending on your system on chip. Uh, I'm not exactly sure on the MP1 what the slip state of those pins is, is exactly um, doing. Um, but it's, it's ensuring that there are less current leakage through those pins generally. And um, what the kernel will do is that when you go into suspend, um, so enter a low power state, for all the drivers the kernel